and I hope I'm audible now. It should be working now, <laughs> the audio. I hope it is. All right. Um, is the audio fine for those who are online? No, it's not adjusted is what they're saying. OK, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's, it's fine now, it seems. OK, perfect. OK, yeah, we'll begin. Uh, so last class, we were looking at the doctrine of humanity, of humankind. Um, and uh, so today, we will look at the doctrine of sin. Now, if you look in your notes, uh, you have a chapter which combines sin and salvation. And then you have one more chapter which combines justification, sanctification, and all of that. So, uh, you know, in your notes, we basically have nine um, doctrines mentioned, or maybe 10, whereas we, on the other hand, the 11 was just an um, uh, introduction. But we have 12 sessions to cover, which is why you know I've kind of separated them. So today we would be looking only at the doctrine of sin. We will deal with salvation as a separate uh, topic, all right, so that we would be able to you know um, go through it in detail and cover all the 12 sessions that we are meant to cover. All right, so, um, so today uh, we would be covering only the doctrine of sin and uh, salvation. We will look at that a little later, a few sessions later. So, all right. Um, so when we say sin, uh, we basically mean three different things. There are actions which can be sinful, uh, or stealing, lying, all of that. Uh, there would be attitudes which are sinful. Uh, so, you know, pride and greed and jealousy and anger. So we have. Um, uh, actions which are sinful we have attitudes that are sinful but we also have something on the inside the very nature the very human nature which is sinful so uh, there are three levels of sin operating you know in in the average person uh, so um if we were to see uh, you know let's just say maybe exodus chapter 20 verse 17 if someone could read out Exodus 20, verse 17. And if you could just maybe read out the first portion of 2017, that should do. Male servant, nor is female servant. Nor his ox, nor his donkey, nor anything that's your neighbor's. All right. So here it's talking about not coveting, not being greedy for something that does not belong to you. Uh, you know, not wanting to somehow, in a in a wrong manner, take hold of what does not belong to you. So over here it's talking about. It says in this commandment, this is one of the ten commandments, and it says here, you shall not covet. So over here, uh, we see that there can be an, a, a sinful action involved where if a person acts on this covetousness and tries to steal you know, the other person's oxen or donkeys, uh, then, or, or, you know, or in fact, even their slaves, if they were to try to steal that, that would be a sinful action. Uh, but there's also this attitude which we see in this person who is coveting. It does not belong to him. All of those things don't belong to him. But he is wishing that he could make it his. And he's kind of thinking in his mind, what can I do to claim these things? How can I get hold of it? So there's also the attitude of covetousness. But why is this person, in fact, even thinking these things? It is because inside, on the inside, he has a sinful nature, which is uh, causing him to uh, you know, manifest covetousness. It's causing him to manifest jealousy. He's jealous of his neighbor because he has uh, better slaves and better property and maybe a better looking wife 
all of that. So the sinful nature inside is manifesting on the outside in different ways. And so we, it's not just that people are doing something wrong once in a while. It's not that they just sometimes have some sinful attitudes. Everything inside them tries to go against what God wants because of the sinful nature which is there inside people. Which is why, you know, when uh, David is speaking in Psalm 51, you know, it's one of the most uh, well-known, famous psalms because that's the psalm where he talks about what he is feeling inside after Nathan confronts him, Prophet Nathan confronts him and says, you know, the adultery which you did is sinful in God's eyes. You thought you got away with it. You thought you escaped. But um, God knows what you did. And you know, God regards what you have done as a sin. And there will be judgment because of that. So after Nathan had spoken those words, uh, this, is, this is what David was you know, feeling on the inside. First of all, being a good person, he admitted. He didn't make any excuses. That's one of the first fundamental things that we can do when we are corrected by God. Instead of starting off with a long list of excuses, it's better to just admit that what you have done is sinful. And, and you know, we see David displaying that. He makes no excuses. He admits that what he has done is sinful. And now there's a lot of feelings going on inside. He can feel the disapproval of God, the wrath of God. Uh, he's scared about the judgment which is to come. But at the same time, he can see that God is right in what he has said. And he is ashamed of himself too. He, he sees the sinfulness in him. And he says, you know, um, um, in Psalm 51 verses 4 to 6. If someone could read out for us Psalm 51 verses 4 to 6. Mm. Have the workers of iniquity no knowledge? Who ate of my people as they ate bread? I don't think it's the right verse. Psalm 51, uh, verses 4 to oh, 6. Sorry. You only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you judge. So verses 4 to 6. Be, uh, behold, I was brought forth in iniquity, and in sin my mother conceived me. Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts, and in the hidden part you will make me to know wisdom. All right. So over here we see in these verses that um, David admits, he says, uh, against you, you only have I sinned. So yes. He, in fact, sinned against uh, Bathsheba's husband. He sinned against Bathsheba herself. He sinned against his own body. All of these things are there. But he understands that ultimately, Lord, what I did was displeasing to you. What I have done is sinful against you. And that is why he says, you are right in your verdict. And you are justified when you are judging me, is what he says. And then he goes on to say, you know, I, you know, I have been sinful in my attitudes right from the time I was conceived. It's something that he understands about himself. He, he looks at himself, looks at what he has done, and pro he probably asks himself, why, why did I do something so terrible? Where was my brain? What was I thinking? And he realizes that his entire life, his attitudes have always been sinful. You know. The inclinations of his heart have always been towards doing wrong. And so he needs like a revelation to him. And he says, from the time uh, I was conceived, you know, from the time I was in the womb, I always seem to have been inclined more towards sinfulness. So he says, surely I was sinful at birth, sinful from the time my mother conceived me, he says. And then he, you know, says in the next verse, he says, yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb. You taught me wisdom in that secret place. Uh, now, obviously, you know, um, we got to understand in what sense he is saying these, uh, you know, sentences. Because in verse 5, when he says, from the womb I was sinful, obviously it is not saying that that little fetus, you know, inside the mother's womb was busy committing sinful deeds. 
it's little impossible so he is basically saying the attitude of that little fetus even before it could you know it had, it had a chance to act out its nature already in its nature it was sinful and so once the baby is born and once the child is old enough to start you know standing up on its feet and moving around from that time itself the child begins to display its nature it begins with very very small acts the mom the mummy says something and then you know the, that little toddler you know uh, stubbornly says no you know so it starts off at that stage itself and then when they grow up a little more then they realize oh i can cover up what i did so now now it's not just a matter of you know saying no to mummy you do what you want and then you cover it up so that mummy will not know that you did it so you see now you become a little more intelligent so that nature which is inside starts displaying on the outside and so he makes a very right correct observation he says from the time of my birth i have been sinful is what he admits um and then he says you know in verse 6 he says yet you desired faithfulness even in the womb you taught me wisdom in that secret place now over here you know is is he saying that um god was giving you know uh, training to the fetus and saying you know what when you're born you should be do should do this 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 no uh, it's basically saying that god has put that inside the heart of each human that they should know what is right what is wrong so even that little unformed fetus which is still developing already has been placed with the moral absolutes of god inside its you know inside its being so when the child begins to grow you know at the age of 2 or the age of 3 they begin to sense what is right and what is wrong in the sense the parents tell them the parents say you know do this don't do this and so they begin to kind of understand that there is such a thing as right and such a thing as wrong but even on their own you see once they have crossed the age of 3 even if the parent has directly not said don't do something they sense it immediately when they do something wrong they realize that oh what i'm doing is a little fishy not good it is something that has been placed inside that person in the womb itself so in that sense it says in the womb itself god placed this instinctive knowing that he wants faithfulness he wants wisdom he wants what is good but the evil side the evil nature which is there in that person takes control uh, so which is why even though the person knows instinctively that they what is good and what is bad they are unable to you know freely accept uh, what is good and they get laid i mean led led away so um regarding this um you know john calvin he came up with a technical term to describe this nature of humans he called it total depravity or depravity depending on how we pronounce it he called it total depravity um he, he was not saying that humans are completely depraved as in they'll only do evil we we do good as well but he meant total depravity in the sense is a complete inability to reach up to god's perfect standards so every human suffers from this we have this total inability to reach up to the standards that god has you know set for us um so a person may be a very loving and committed father and husband and all of that but that very very loving man when he goes to the office you know if his boss is ill treating him and you know uh, treating him harshly that same person loving person may struggle to show love towards the boss so you see he is trying to reach up to some standards of love but he's unable to reach the uh, you know the entire uh, uh, he's not able to go the entire distance and display complete divine god like love so he is falling short of the required standards I, I, i mean in 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 the same way you know uh, there may be a person uh, who is being sincere in all of their outward um, you know deeds uh, they go to church regularly they read the bible without fail uh, you know they spend time in prayer they are doing everything but inside they have no control over their uh, you know um, internal attitudes on the outside when someone comes and says something rude to you you have learned how to smile 
and you know keep your mouth closed you don't say anything but what do you do with that hatred which is building up on the inside that too is sin in god's eyes so uh, so these are all the issues that we face when we are trying to you know uh, fight against sin on our own okay so um this is what you know uh, paul says about himself uh, i think we we in fact touched upon that in one of the previous sessions philippians 3:6 uh, he says you know i mean the, he's he's kind of talking about his past life and he's talking about how uh, he's in fact um when it comes to jewish traditions he's like the ultimate uh, he has everything in his background which you know can um, establish him as the ultimate jew the most ideal role model of how a jew should be so talking about th those things you know he says when it came to zeal you know religious zeal i was like the best and one of the things that he says over there in in uh, philippians 3:6 he says as for righteousness based on the law faultless i have been faultless when it comes to righteousness which is based on the law you know which is like all about the outward things uh he is a man who always went to the temple and did every single ritual required of him he is one person when it came to tithing he would make sure that every little bit has been tithed he was one person when it came to you know um giving alms to the poor and all of the all of those things which were expected of them he did all of those things but then in romans 7 when he talks about what's going on inside you no know, he talks about the that constant battle going on between him and sin inside that he had no control over that he could not help and so we see um you know um that is why it says in james 2:10 i mean again a scripture which we have looked upon looked at earlier whoever keeps the whole law and yet stumbles at just one point is guilty of breaking all of it so paul who was faultless in the way he kept the mosaic law even he failed miserably because inside he could not control what was going on he could not rectify that he could not change that and which is why it says in romans 320 if someone can read out romans 320 please therefore by the deeds of the law no flesh will be justified in his sight for by the law is the knowledge of sin okay so uh, here it says um, no one will be declared righteous in god's sight by the works of the law because you know we all fail in keeping the law uh, rather through the law we become conscious of our sin you know could we have people reading out in you know, with from bibles which have normal english because uh, when we read out from the i don't know from whatever versions are being read out the nothing comes across we just have a bunch of very nice sounding words but you know if we can just have people reading out from normal translations which you are using current day english because see this is what he's actually saying over here he says no one will be declared righteous in god's sight by the works of the law rather through the law we become conscious of our sin so all that law is doing is that it's making us aware that i'm not meeting up to the standards the law is showing me that these are the standards that god has laid but uh, the law is also pointing out that see you have not been able to meet those standards so the more we uh, try to keep the law we the more we become aware of our sinfulness and we realize that we can never be declared righteous in god's sight by the works that we do all right um so this being the case um why why do we have this sinful nature just to look at you know very briefly at the background of why uh, we have a sinful nature of course we'll not get into the entire you know adam and eve story because we're already familiar with that but just to read out one scripture uh, romans chapter 5 verse 12 if someone could read out romans 5 verse 12 therefore just as through one man sin entered the world and death through sin and thus death spread to all men because all sinned yeah so you see it's saying so plainly over there sin entered the world through one man 
and once sin had entered the world through one man and we know who that is right adam uh, so adam and eve are the ones who are um, you know but only adam is mentioned over here in this verse not eve because adam had a had the free will to say no to eve if he had wanted to uh, so even though he was basically the spiritual head you know uh, of that particular couple that that particular family unit he chose to um, act upon what his wife is saying he chose to take his decision against god rather than for god and participate with her in the sin so god holds him accountable so it said sin has entered the world through one man it says and now because of him all have sinned you know it says so um, and in this way death came to all people because all sinned so all of humanity not just adam and eve all of us have inherited that sinful nature yeah go ahead so one of the consequences one of the by products of sin is that it has brought death along with it yes and it's so clear in the way it says in the uh, okay we just had one student reading out from gnb uh, the good news uh, bible and yeah the wording is very very clear over there um yeah so uh, what did god do regarding this thing this action of adam and eve which he knew beforehand itself you know that he knew that it would lead to the fall of humanity uh, so what did god do regarding that uh, maybe one verse that we can look at about that uh, first peter 1 verse 20 you know we are not really getting into the details of all of these uh, uh, verses because we are already familiar with the concepts so you know we are, we are not wasting time on uh, concepts that which we are already familiar with we'll just look at the verses which pertain to that and you know keep and keep moving so first peter 1 20 if someone could read out um he indeed was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you okay so uh, so he over here the he so jesus christ that is being mentioned christ jesus you know it says in that translation he was foreordained someone appointed him in in the niv it just says in uh, normal english jesus christ was chosen before the creation of the world so when was he chosen before the creation of the world itself he was chosen and now he's being revealed you know in these last times uh, because now it was the correct time for him to come down to the earth and perform his work on the cross so god was it's not that god was suddenly caught unaware when adam and eve sinned god already knew that this would happen and god had already arranged the redemption plan you know at that time itself so um, even before uh, the creation of the world god had already chosen and appointed jesus christ to be able to redeem us from our sins so we see that in the uh, scriptures sin is almost described like a independent force like an independent entity uh, right from genesis itself we kind of see that of, of course you know in paul's uh, roman 7 uh, thing we you know he says i want to do what is good i'm not able to do it because this it's not me because in, in my mind i want to you know please god i want to keep the law but but this is the, the, there's something else in my members he says you know which is sin and that sin is making me do that which is wrong he almost talks of it like as if it's one independent force almost like as if it's some kind of independent entity which is you no know, ordering him and making him do what is wrong and we see the same idea right in the beginning in Genesis chapter 4 itself. Um, so if someone could read out Genesis 4 verse 7. Genesis 4 7. If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door and its desire is for you but you should rule over it okay so um um it says sin lies at the door but that word which is used over there the hebrew word that comes out better you know in in uh, the other translation where it says sin is crouching at your door it's almost like a animal you know like a, like a wild animal which is like crouching waiting 
to pounce. If you allow the door to be opened, it will come inside and it will attack. So right there in the very, very beginning, you know, um, God is speaking to Cain and he's saying, you know, you just need to change your attitude. Uh, you came and offered your sacrifice. Uh, Abel also came and offered his sacrifice. I found Abel's sacrifice acceptable, but yours was not acceptable. So uh, obviously you have done something which has not pleased me. And looks like in this case, Cain knew what it is that, you know, what that was lacking on his side. So God is saying, why don't you rectify that? Why don't you correct it? Because you know what I have found displeasing about your particular sacrifice. Why are you not willing to act upon that? And so he says, if you do, um, yeah, uh, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, something very much, much more dangerous is awaiting you. It's not just you making a mistake. It's you opening your door and allowing a wild, wild animal to come and take over. And once it takes control, you will not have, um, you know, no, 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 not be able to control the consequences. And that's exactly what happens. Even after God has given that warning, given that warning so lovingly, Cain refuses, you know, to act upon that. He is, he does not close the door. He keeps that door open. And so you literally have sin coming inside, taking over. He has no control over himself. His rage continues building, building, building to a point where he, you know, he um, actually murders his uh, brother. Uh, so, um, so sin is a force that has been released into the world because of what Adam did. And now, um, uh, because we also have the sinful nature inside us, you know, we are unable to do what is good. So um, maybe we could also look at the Romans 7 passage, uh, which is, I know, a slightly lengthier passage. But then, you know, uh, it talks about the frustration that he is facing, that Paul is facing. And it talks about sin, um, you know, literally almost being like a independent force which is acting upon him. So even as we read that particular passage, you know, just kind of follow the wording and try to see, you know, where it talks about sin, how it is sin who is living in him, which is making him do those things. You know, look at the wordings that Paul very, very carefully under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, the kind of wordings that he uses over there. So Romans chapter 7, if we could read out verses 15 up to 20, Romans 7, 15 to 20. For what I am doing, I do not understand. For at what I will to do, that I do. Not practice, but what I hate, that I do. If then I do what I will not do, I agree with the law that it is good. But now it is no longer. I who do it, but sin that dwells in me, for I know that in me, that is in my flesh, nothing good dwells, for to will is present with me. But how to perform what is good, I do not find. For the, for the good that I will to do, I do not do. But the evil I will not do, not to do, that I practice. Now I, if I do what I will not to do, it is no longer I who do it, but sin that dwells in me. So we have over here, um, he says in verse 16, uh, verse 15. Yeah, verse 15, he of course starts off by saying, what I want to do, I do not do. What I hate to do, you know, that I'm actually doing is what he says. And then in verse 17, he says, it is no longer I myself who do it. But it is sin living in me, you know, he, he points out. Um, and of course, all of these verses are verses which are talking about his life before, you know, he accepts the Lord Jesus, has this encounter with the Lord Jesus. Because in the very next chapter, he talks about how Jesus Christ set him free from this whole mess. You know, so, um, so, in, uh, so sorry. In, in verse 20, he says, it is again, he repeats, he says, now if I do what I do not want to do, it is no longer I who do it, but it is sin living in me that does it. You know, so um, it, sin is like a slave master. It controls, it forces you to do things that, you know, um, you. so when the little child is still in the womb, 
God has placed in that little child a knowing about what is good and what is bad. The child already knows it. And as the child grows, the child wants to be good. It's a desire which it's all it's already there. The desire is there. But a child cannot actually do good in all instances, you know, in on all occasions, in every way to the level that God wants because of this sinful master, the slave master who is always driving this person towards what is evil. And that is why a lot of people, they feel ashamed of what they are doing. It's not that they enjoy it. There are, of course, those who have, you know, hardened their conscience and they enjoy their sin. But a lot of people actually feel ashamed of what they are, what they are becoming, but they don't know how to make, you know, how to, how to get rid of that, uh, of that state of being. On the other hand, a believer is not in that helpless condition. A believer, on the other hand, is able to overcome uh, sinfulness. So let's look at Romans chapter 8, verse 5, which looks at the victory which we have. Romans 8, 5. For those who live according to the flesh, set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who live according to the spirit, the things of the spirit. Okay, so over here, the believer has a choice to choose whether they want to place their minds on the things of the flesh, just like the rest of the world, or if whether they would like to keep their minds on the things of the spirit, because... Uh, believers are a new creation. They are no longer under the control of the slave master. So they can actually make a choice. They can allow their mind to go on dwelling on the things which the rest of the world is dwelling upon. Or they can say, no, I will renew my mind and I will set my mind on the things which please God. They do have a choice to, to you know, uh, for this other option. And this is something which is not available to, uh, you know, unbelievers who have not yet accepted the Lord. Uh, so, um, yeah, you know, that, that it's basically Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7, which we have talked about many, many times, where it says very plainly that the old self was crucified with Christ. Uh, so, um, which is why, as a new creation, now we have the choice, we have the free choice to choose whether we want to dwell, keep our minds on godly things which please the Spirit, or we want to continue, you know, entertaining in our minds the things which the world is chasing after uh, so coming to the you know uh, the word that is used in the new testament um, about sin and of course we have heard this you know in a lot of sermons uh, the term that is used one of the most common greek words that is used for sin um, in the new testament uh, is the word hamartia so that word hamartia, H-A-M-A-R-T-I-A, hamartia, that word basically means missing the mark. That's the most common term. There are many other terms also used for sin in the New Testament and in the Old Testament. But the most common one that we find, in fact, I think, I don't know whether it was in your notes or somewhere else that I read it. You know, if you were to look at that particular word and its Hebrew equivalent, uh, you would see that word being mentioned 900 times in the Old and New Testament. This term which talks about missing the mark. And that word is used for sin, where, where you know a person has missed the mark. Now, this was a um, term that you would use uh, in archery. Now, those who are not familiar with that word archery, that's basically you know uh, shooting with bow and arrow. Uh, that's basically archery. So it's a it's a it's an archery term. As in, you know, you, you miss the mark. And uh, an example that is used to bring out the meaning of that term, uh, you know, they use the example of Judges chapter 20, verse 16. If we can have someone read out Judges 20, verse 16. Okay, so um, there were these soldiers, 700 of them, who had a special skill with the bow and arrow. And it says over here, you know, someone can stand over there holding a single hair. Okay, you just hold one single hair in your hand and you stand over there. They can hit, 
with the arrow so accurately that they know they, they will hit the that one strand of hair which you are holding. So if that arrow goes a little that side, it will miss the hair. If the arrow comes a little this side, the poor man who's holding the hair will you know, die. But they're able to hit so accurately, you know, it says over here that they can uh, what they can uh, sling a, uh, a stone at a hair and not miss. Okay, so okay, I guess they they do their practice with stones before actually trying it out, trying it out with bow and arrow. Uh, so yeah, so the guy holding the hair would only get stoned. He at least would not get uh, shot with an arrow. But yeah, you know that the whole point they're making over here is that these are um, you know uh, troops who are so skillful in the way that you know they can fight. So they never miss the mark. Okay, they're exactly on target. And that is what God expects of us. So when that little baby is still being formed in the womb, you know, God's, you know, God puts that those moral absolutes in the in the child's heart. And it's like God is saying, you know, this is the standard I have set. This is the mark which I want you to hit every single time. This is the standard I want you to maintain is what God puts inside each of us, in, inside each of our hearts, which is why people feel guilt when they sin, because they instinctively realize, oh, I have missed that mark, that target which God has you know, set for me. I missed it. So, they, so people have that understanding. They realize it, which is why in Romans 3.23, and we're very, very familiar with that verse. If someone could just read it out, Romans 3.23, it says, We, we all fall short. We know what the standards are. We know what God has set in place. But we are in unable. We fall short of what is required. And so, you know, um, people talk a lot about sins of commission and omission. And they, you know, they, they talk about how sins of commission is something which we do most of the time. But I think the biblical emphasis is more on sins of omission. God is not so much interested in what you do in outward show. He's more interested in with what motive you do it, with what kind of a heart you're doing it. So I think, uh, you know, um, sins of omission is something more uh, that we, we actually fall more into sins of omission. Of course, we fall into sins of commission as well. So what do I mean by this whole uh, thing about omission and commission and all of that? Um, you know, sins of omission would be basically failing to do good that we know that we should do so god has already finished setting his standards he has said you know these are the, these are the things that i want you to do this is what will please me so we already know what is good what is expected of us but we fail to meet that even though we are aware that those are good things to do we are unable to do them so that would be sins of omission um, in the sense we, I mean, especially if we are believers, we can sense the Holy Spirit inside us telling us to do those things. For instance, if someone, you know, is in, is in need, you know, we feel that inside our hearts, you must reach out and, you know, and, and help that person in some way. Um, but, you know, we choose to just ignore that leading. That would become a sin of omission. You have not broken any law. You have not gone, gone and punched anyone on the nose. You have not, uh, you know, uh, lied. You have not stolen anything. You've not done any of those things. But in your heart, you know that that person is struggling and you are in a position to help them. But it's going to take time. It's going to take effort. It's going to probably going to take some money. And you don't really want to get involved. What you have done is a sin of omission. You knew that the good that you are supposed to do, but you have chosen not to do it okay so that would be a, um, a sin of omission um so james 4:17 uh, is the most popular verse that is used to explain that if someone could read out james 4:17 yeah now that's a good translation it says they know the right thing to do but they don't do it okay so that would be a sin of omission uh why have these planes decided to change their flight route they won't come back again how do you know they spoke to you personally okay. 
uh, yeah sorry uh, romans 5:14 if someone could read because that also talks about uh, you know sin of omission it talks in fact in fact it talks about both types of sin uh, yeah so if someone could read out romans 5:14 over here it's talking about how death is reigning even over those people who did not sin by breaking a command okay so they have not broken a direct command they have not gone and stolen something they have not murdered someone but they have also not done the good which they know they should they should they should have taken the initiative to go forward and do the good which they are sensing in their heart but they have not done that so even such people are under the reign of death because they too have sinned so it talks about how adam actually broke a direct command he broke a direct instruction given by god but even people who have not broken direct commands given by god they too are sinful because even though they sense in their heart that they are meant to do certain things they have not gone and done the good which they know that they should do so in that sense they too have missed the mark so um a very uh, you know pertinent example that we can use in fact would be the parable of the good samaritan you know which we, which you would find in luke chapter 10 verses 25 to 37 being a very very familiar parable we will not get into the details but look at that priest and the levite who pass by there's that man lying over there half dead and they must be aware that you know if they leave him lying over there without any medical help is going to die they are aware of that but what do this priest and the levite do in the parable they look at him and they act like as if they were not seen and they go on because you know they have spiritual duties to perform they need to go go to the temple and you know do the things which are required over there and if they get late for the job then how so you know so they they know in their heart what they should do uh, but they do not do it okay so those would be your sins of omission because you know we talk a lot about the sins of commission and we say you should not break the laws which god has placed we should be careful uh, not to you know uh, defy his instructions so we are very very aware of that but you know let's take a moment to also examine ourselves and ask ourselves on a daily basis how many sins of omission are we doing where we are not breaking any direct instruction but there are a whole bunch of things that the lord expects us to be doing you know and so are we doing even that or are we missing the mark okay so if we don't do those things we are actually missing the mark um so in this sense you know um okay yeah maybe we can look at one more verse matthew chapter 23 verse 23 if someone can read out matthew 23 23 who woe to you scribes and pharisees hypocrites for you pay tithe of mint and anise and cumin and have neglected the weightier matters of the law justice and mercy and faith this you ought to have done without leaving the others undone okay here it's talking about how um, you know they are very very careful when it comes to tithing but jesus says you have neglected the more important matters of the law justice mercy faithfulness and then he goes on to say you should have practiced the latter without neglecting the former so you should be very very careful about following the direct laws of god which have been laid down you know like the whole tithing thing and all of that but at the same time you should also be doing the other category where it's not clearly said you know do this 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 but it's indicated in those direct laws so the the so this is why it says you know it's not enough to just follow the letter of the law you should also be following the spirit of the law what is that law trying to convey the love that it is trying to convey the the righteousness which that particular law is standing up for you should be doing even those aspects which are not mentioned literally in the lettering 
but it's expected in the attitude of that law which was laid out then that you and you should be able to fulfill even those and so if god's mark the mark that he has set is that high it becomes impossible for any human to do it on their own okay so uh, coming to sins of commission that's just basically you know you directly disobeying or breaking a commandment that god has given so god's will is some particular thing and you are doing something else which is not god's will so each time we do something which is not god's will and we are doing the opposite of what he is asking us to do that just becomes a sin of uh, commission for instance the people in the old testament he told them you shall keep the sabbath on that day you shall not work so they went and did exactly the opposite they worked on that day so god's will was that they should rest and not work they did the exact opposite they actually went and worked and uh, i in one of the former classes we had looked at an example of that we had looked at nehemiah chapter 13 verses 15 to 22 where the people were so eager to do the exact opposite that they would actually wait near the gates trying to get in on the sabbath day so that they can do uh, you know um, their own business so um, you know they were going directly against god's will against god's instruction so that would be a sin of commission is a third way that we can sin we can be doing very very good things but maybe those are not good things that god wanted us to do maybe he actually you know he, his purpose for us was to do something else so just if you are busy doing a lot of good things that does not necessarily mean that you are you know in the will of god a person can choose to be doing many many good things and still be outside god's will if they are not following his leading if they are ignoring his uh, leading yeah yeah so uh, the question raised was uh, about a person who is uh ministering to people so ministering to people is always a good thing but what if they are neglecting their own quiet time with the lord uh so that is something that is important to the lord so it would it would be a matter of balancing all aspects of life and doing everything in line with god's will yes so that would definitely be an example uh so in the same way a person you know they sense in their heart that god does not want them to take up that particular job but then the pay over there is higher the perks over there are greater so you just ignore that leading in your heart and you go ahead and you take that particular job even though you're achieving a lot in that job and doing a lot for that organization it's not what god wanted so even when doing good things yes it is possible to you know um, uh, move away from uh, you know move into disobedience so yes that is a third way that we could end up sinning against the lord so now it's 9:50 so we'll take a break um so if you if you can come back and log in once again at um 10 o'clock please yeah you're free to go yes